At the end of the 15th century, 170,000 people were living in Venice, more than there ever have been since. La Serenissima was then at her peak. Thanks to her powerful fleet built in the town's arsenal, Venice dominated the Mediterranean. From Tunis to Beirut, the city of the Doges was the only colonial power of the Middle Ages. Venice was like a fish in water. We have documents from chroniclers and ancient historians who say that water must be protected because it's our most precious community property. This is the reason that there were lagoon specialists and canal specialists. That was the challenge to the Venetian magistrates, to preserve the lagoon and the water surrounding their town. But towards the end of the 15th century, the authorities made a frightening discovery. Their beautiful fish was about to be suffocated by the sand. How could this have happened? What massive works would have to be undertaken to combat the silting up? How would the Venetians of the 15th century save Venice? The danger came from the rivers that flowed into the lagoon. It was beginning to get silted up with the sediment that the rivers always carried along. The canals were getting too shallow for the bigger ships that you know, were important for Venice as a trading empire and also for its military expansion. It needed to be able to have the ships come and go with the... <clears throat> you know, with their soldiers and mariners, etc. But this should be very dangerous for the city, survival itself, because then this could be a possibility for the enemy of Venice to attack the city from, from inland. How would the Venetians cope with this whim of nature? In the course of long debates in the Palace of the Doges, two visions of the town's future were in opposition. The people believed that the life of the city should evolve along the lines of how the lagoon was changing. So if the lagoon was silting up, then Venice should think of a future for itself and transition to agriculture, for example, because, you know, um, they discovered rice. I think they already knew about corn. And then there were other people in the city that said, no, we're very good at, at sailing. We need to maintain Venice as a maritime republic, and therefore we need to do things to stop the lagoon from silting up. In the end, it was those in favor of water who carried the day. The idea of the Grand Canal turned into a field of corn was unthinkable. The water had to be saved at all costs, and to do that, they had a wild idea to reroute the Sile and Brenta rivers so that they would empty their sediment outside the lagoon. They were about to achieve an amazing feat, to dig 300 kilometers of new canals with 15th century tools, gigantic works which would take 100 years. From that time, the, the, the lagoon is no more, let's say, really natural anymore because the present shape of the lagoon is the result of a big effort that men that live in that area put to keep the lagoon in the, in the same uh, shape as it is. Thanks to these major works, the Venetians managed to preserve the maritime identity of their town. But the water that the Venetians wanted so much to save ended up by turning against them dramatically. Because other, even more serious problems were lying in wait for the city of the Doges. The subsidence of the bed of the lagoon on the one hand and the rise in the water level on the other made a dangerous combination. How were the Venetians going to deal with this new threat? What unheard of technical exploits would they have to accomplish? Today, La Serenissima still stands proud of the water. 
But the lagoon has changed. Cars, trains, and even airplanes were further added to the maritime traffic, which increased tenfold. And there would soon be factories, a refinery, a power station, and a shipyard. With the 20th century, Venice joined the modern world. And it was the lagoon that paid the price. We're seeing the drainage of vast areas of the lagoon in order to build industrial zones. The port of Marghera is an example of man's intervention. The drying out means the cancellation, even the annihilation of the aquatic environment. Built from 1917 onwards, the industrial area and the roads to the airport have taken up one-tenth of the service area of the lagoon. But that isn't all. To facilitate the movements of the great oil tankers, the entry to the Malamoco Inlet was widened up to 900 meters. And a new canal was dug right in the middle of the lagoon. Instead of the ships following the natural path of the channel, which was quite convoluted, they dug this straight highway across the lagoon very wide and very deep. It's just like a motorway that drains much too much water towards Venice and threatens the city of the Doges. The water no longer spreads out in the same way. The natural canals are disturbed by the tanker's channel that absorbs all the currents. It's a hydraulic disaster. The ancient natural environment has been destroyed in just 30 years. And that isn't all. To satisfy the needs of industry, 8,000 wells were dug to pump water from the water table, which is just under the foundations of Venice. In the 1950s, up to 40,000 cubic meters of water were drawn every day. This uh, generate uh, uh, decrease of the pressure. By pumping, we reduce the pressure in the layers of sand. And when the pressure goes down in such a special and fragile soil as there is in Venice, the geological strata are compacted with the result that the ground subsides. So it's that we, right now we call it subsidence, land subsidence. The result was that Venice sank 15 centimeters in only 30 years. The lagoon, mistreated in this way, would eventually avenge itself on the Venetians, and the town itself paid the price. On November 4, 1966, a particularly powerful high tide caused the water to rise almost two meters above sea level. It was the worst flood that the Venetians had ever known. The water started to rise, and when it should have started to go down, after about two hours, it didn't. Quite the opposite, it just kept rising. Communications were cut off. We had no radio, telephone, or electricity. We were really frightened that day. 80% of the town was flooded. St. Mark's Square was under 120 centimeters of water for 30 hours. The tanks of fuel oil and diesel overflowed and polluted the town. But in all this misfortune, there was one piece of luck. Not one person was killed. But nearly 5,000 people found themselves homeless that day. The Venetians and the whole world understood that day that if you attack a natural system, the system will fight back. Among the first measures taken was that they stopped pumping from the water table. But the damage had been done. The 13 centimeters lost would never be recuperated. 
and a further threat was imminent, global warming and the rise in sea levels. This caused the water in the canals to rise 10 centimeters. In all, Venice lost 23 centimeters. The figure can be seen on the facades today. The area that was most vulnerable is the one that is green today. It indicates the rising and falling of the tides. It's not the king tides that do most damage to the town. It's the everyday tides. The water comes and goes, comes and goes continuously. Nowadays, with every tide, salt water reaches the brick walls. An upheaval that challenges the precautions taken by the architects of the past. The Istrian stone that formed the impermeable foundations of the palaces is no longer of any use as a protective ring. The water is always against the brickwork, and the bricks are very permeable, and the water evaporates from the bricks, leaving behind the salts which crystallize. And as salts crystallize, they expand in volume 12 times. And that like, is a very kind of slow way of, you can say, exploding brickwork. The salt water also attacks the lime mortar. As a result, the bricks fall out and the structure as a whole is weakened. To reinforce them, these iron barriers are springing up in the town's canals. The owners have to pay the costs of restoration, but the town council can't make them do it. Today, a third of Venetian palaces are damaged and need renovating. <laughs> 